Welcome to Season 1 of Fairtech's Digital Marketing Masterclass, a podcast dedicated to collecting the insights of the marketing world's leading thought leaders to teach you the ideal systems of generating leads, nurturing leads into clients, and converting clients into raving fans of your company, your brand, and your vision. Today, we are joined by Todd Smith, our VP of Partner Growth, and Pam Didner. Pam is a no-nonsense marketer. As a B2B marketing consultant, author, and speaker, she gets straight to the point. Having been on the client side for nearly 20 years, she has developed frameworks and approaches to tackle clients' marketing problems. Most importantly, she works to better align marketing with sales. Her latest book is a short ebook called The Modern AI Marketer, which takes you on a journey starting with the history of AI, AI applications in the modern marketing world, and how to drive AI initiatives at work. It also includes useful resources such as books, podcasts, and blogs to further expand your AI knowledge. Pam, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Happy Friday. This, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's great. So I, to our listeners, uh, we have an awesome show planned for you today. Um, and, <laughs> and what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk to you about like this story that we tell our clients quite a bit about perspective. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, is that we have this, um, this, di- this cartoon. I'm going to, I'm going to show it right now. Show and, es- <laughs> and essentially what it is, is it's a cartoon that basically shows the same exact situation yeah. looked at from two different perspectives. Uh huh. All right. And one okay. person has been on a boat forever and they finally see land and they feel like, hey, you know what? I'm going to be rescued. And then the second person is on land and they feel like they're finally going to get rescued by the boat. It's the same situation. It's the same um, story, but seen from two different points of view. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that cartoon. One was like, land! <laughs> the other was like, boat! <laughs> Okay. And then they yeah. see each other as that, you know what, we are yeah. really not helping each other We're right now. Lost. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And that, and that is why we have you on the show. And here's okay. why. is because if you see the gentleman over here to my right, All right. this is Todd Smith. Todd, has Hi, Todd. Our, <laughs> Todd is our VP of, um, of Partner Growth. He has been in sales for over 20 years. All right. I started, <laughs> I started Ferritech 20 years ago. He's 20 years sales. I'm 20 years marketing. We see problems in very different lights. And I totally understand. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny because the marriage between the two of us, somewhere in the middle, is why we've been as successful as we've been. <laughs> because, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, so let's talk about the differences between sales and marketing then. Yeah. Well, well you have the book on sales and marketing. <laughs> so we're like... I mean, like, Todd, I'm going to call Pam in here and she's going to totally say I'm right and you're completely wrong and I need a professional, I need a marriage counselor to come in here square this up. <laughs> so who's right, Pam? Yeah. All right, we'll settle the disputes once for all. all. Right. Once all for right. all. We'll take well, care of that. We'll, well take Pam, care let, of that. Let me no start problem. with this question um, because I did, read, sure. I did read your book and I thought it was really cool. And once again um, – it, the perspective Thank is you. that, you know, Chris is the CEO. So, you know what CEO means, right? Yeah. It means he's always right. But yeah. um, he's also been the primary salesperson. Oh, he does well, nothing. Yeah, he does very little. A lot of delegating. There's four yeah. Ds. One of them is delegating. Yeah. Um, but he, yeah, he's also it. been the primary salesperson for our company way before I came along. That definitely makes However, sense. However, yeah. you know, my role now that I've been hired in the last 18 months is, is sales. And I would suggest that Chris, although he has a foot in sales, he's probably, you know, he's got more marketing in his blood than I ever will, right? Um, but he still has his hand in sales. So the quote from mm-hmm. your book is, you need to think like a salesperson to support your sales team. Right. Oh, you, oh, you know yes. the quote. Good. So my, my question is, <laughs> how do you coach marketers? to think like salespeople and then vice versa. Okay. I always quote, uh, quote a movie, Glenn Gary, uh-huh. Glenn mm-hmm. Ross. Yep. Is that Glenn right? Glenn Gary, yep. Glenn, yeah. Glenn Ross. And um, so Alec Bowen actually have a very iconic scenes and in talking about two things like ABC, uh-huh. always be closing, always be closing, always cl- be closing. So I have that GIF. So whenever I talk to the marketing people, I always show that GIF. The best way and the very simplest way to think like a salesperson as a marketer, you have to keep ABC okay. in mind. 
always be closing. That's what they are thinking about. And the most of the time, the marketers tend to think about top mm-hmm. of the funnel, which is the brain awareness and the driving demand jam. But the salespeople tend Legit. to focus on the bottom of the funnel. How can I close mm-hmm. the deal? How can I close the deal? How can I close the deal? So when I talk to the marketer, I always tell them, one thing you have to keep in mind is ABC. Okay. Right. Always be closing. What can you do to help them close? So that's the key things I tell marketing people. You need to somehow get yourself down to the bottom okay. of the funnel. So, so what's the vice versa to that? So how do like so if the goal here is to bridge this gap, like what's the vice versa? How do you right. coach salespeople to think like marketers? So um marketers, they tend to focus and the, you know, Chris, jump in and tell me I'm totally off on this one. And you are, marketing tend to think a little bit more on the long term, right? And uh, they are thinking about brain awareness. They want to build that brain equity. And they are thinking about, oh, um, everything needs to be aligned and to create that sense of a consistent uh, customer experience. And you have to think from the perspective, uh, as a salesperson, you need to help the marketers, or you need to think like a marketer in terms of they are using different marketing channel to reach out. They have email marketing, they have event marketing, they actually um, say they do social media. So you have to think through that marketing, I use different channels to help you. And uh, I always encourage the salespeople try to understand what are the channels that within your company that your marketers are using. And understand how each channel serves what purpose is going to help the salespeople understand why marketing are do uh, why marketing uh, people are doing things in certain way. Totally. Does that make sense? Yeah. So understanding in terms of the overall marketing channels that the company is using and understand how every the how channels okay. tie together. That's that's actually really, really good advice. All right. Um another quote that I love from your book is um Mm-hmm. Keep your enemy close. What's what's the follow up to that? <laughs> Keep your Keep sales, sales people closer. closer. <laughs> and I, I'm a salesperson, and I didn't take any offense to that, but I actually really enjoyed that statement. So when you consult with organizations, like, do you truly feel that marketing feels like sales is the enemy? I mean, after all, no, I mean, after the same goal. Yeah, you are totally right. In general, like we are, we work in the same company and we have the same business goal and the same business objectives. However, everybody does their job a little Mm -hmm. bit differently, right? It's not what, everybody understand what needs to be accomplished. So it's not what that's the the issue. It's Mm -hmm. how. Everybody approach that business goal differently. Absolutely. Does that make yeah. sense? So it's the how that kind of uh, tangle and the trip everybody. And uh, like I said, um, to get a lead, for example, and the marketing, they have a certain way that from their perspective to get that lead. And then salespeople also have a certain perspective in terms of how to gotcha. get that lead. And uh, to me, is the how that tend to um, uh, create the discussion and also uh, a misalignment mm-hmm. sometimes. And uh, from my perspective, when I talk to the marketers, is I, I always tell them, try to understand from sales perspective in terms of why they do things in yep. certain way. And you are totally right, Chris, that marketers and also salespeople tend to think differently. For me, uh, for a long time, I always thinking, you know, everything needs to be on brand. Everything needs to be on a certain way. But when you work with sales team, they were like, you know what? Just give me something, right? What is the talking point? What can I say for tomorrow's call? Just give me something, right? So they want the information that needs to serve them mm-hmm. like today, right now. So when you talk to them, you need to think through that. It's not necessarily give them a piece of content. Even if you want to give them the piece of content, you need to think through in terms of how they're going to use that and put in the context that they can yep. understand. So I don't think salespeople are enemies. In fact, I feel like salespeople should be marketers sure. BFF. Yeah. And, uh, but you need to understand when you have a BFF, like, you know, like I have like girlfriends, right? I hang out with, and then uh, we uh-huh. go shopping together and we do stuff together and I will say something, they will finish my sentence. And in some, t- and we, that's because we understand right. each other. And uh, when I say, you know, keep your salespeople closer is the ability to understand them 
and then be ability to understand what their needs are and then find a way okay. to support. So that. what what would you recommend like are good strategies for that? Just because, you know, sales and marketing typically sits at other sides of the table. Like what are some good strategies to sort of, you know, increase the BFF this of that relationship? Yeah. So there are a couple things. There are many things that marketers can do and uh-huh. also salespeople can do. And uh, there's one thing from my perspective, Chris, you probably can agree with this. Um, I am sure Todd has meetings, you know, sales huddle meetings, right? Todd's yeah. probably have stuff in the pipeline and also the prospects that he talked to. And he probably talked to you and brief you in terms of what's the status on all those potential accounts that he's going after. That's a probably a weekly sales huddle meeting. And I think one thing that marketers need to do if you are supporting sales is to attend that mm-hmm. weekly sales huddle calls. Mm-hmm. To me, that's very simple. Be part of that conversation. Initially, you probably have nothing right. to offer, right? But over a period of time, once you listen what they are talking about, slowly you will get a sense in terms of what their needs are. So having like attending sales call, from my okay. perspective, is the easiest way and to actually understand sales and support okay, sales. That better. makes sense. Like, you know, sales start talking. Like, Ty, you will be like, oh my God, I want to reach out yeah. to this company and they have not been returning my call. And uh, the marketing people maybe said, hey, you know what? I did a little research on LinkedIn. I'm actually in, I have gotcha. a connection okay. with their procurement. Maybe I can right. reach out. So, like, something like that. So, what you're suggesting is like more collaboration and maybe just sort of um, like, I, I think you're alluding to, I love that habit from uh, seven habits, like, you know, f- first seek to understand then be understood, you know, so sort of understanding. Yes, yeah, me I too. Love I that. love that one yeah. too. So sort of understanding of like where they're coming from and that part of understanding is sort of bringing them into my world and then me going into their world and just kind of getting a different perspective. Exactly. Okay. I like that. Exactly. And, the, and another thing is um, just elaborate, not just have not attending the meeting, but also contribute at the same time, find a joint okay. initiative like to that. work together. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. One of the things that um, I, I had a funny story about this that was, so we're based in Philadelphia and there's a really mm-hmm. large FinTech company that is two towns over. And uh-huh. I'm not, I'm not saying them by name uh, right now, but Okay. I get I get called in there. We're going to be doing their marketing. Uh, we're going to be doing their 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 content and inbound marketing for them. And we develop a gap assessment. And literally, a gap assessment is we're very different from most companies. We're very data heavy. So the first ten weeks, we literally write a book for our clients. This is oh like wow. a three to five years. Nice. You make an Huge. effort to understand your yeah. client. Yeah. Yes. In that process. I say, I'm going to need to speak with your marketing team and I'm going to have to speak with your sales team. I think that's very, like, very wise. Yeah. So I come in and we're all standing up and I start shaking their hands and I'm meeting them. And this is Sally and this is Brian and this is Jake. And, and I'm like, oh, from your marketing team. And then this is from sales. And the sales team introduced me and I'm shaking their hands. And then the weirdest thing happened. Then they started shaking hands with one another because the company was oh, it's so really big. Nice meeting you. <laughs> exactly. The company was so big that the sales team didn't know the marketing team. Oh no. maybe by name. Maybe whatever. And I was just like, I, I know this sounds weird. They were like, where would you like to begin? I was like, I don't know how to tell you this, but everything we just accomplished in the in the introduction is more than anything I'm gonna share with you today. Yeah. Because if your sales team and your marketing team aren't in lockstep and don't even know what each other look like or know where to find each other's desk or anything like that. I'm like, that's a serious problem. (laughs) I know. I do agree with you. I think that tend to happen in uh, uh, big corporations and, um, and also the, um, the roles and responsibility between the two organizations Mm-hmm. And uh, the marketing tend to focus on brand, you know, and the brand equity. And then the salespeople really focus on accounts. And mm-hmm. um, in some organizations, especially big organizations, salespeople have their own sales support. And they kind of get uh, a lot of the content and also a lot of information and uh, a lot of um, uh, inquiries, if you will, through their sales support team. And um mm-hmm. And that kind of provide the cushion or um, in you know, lack of better words, um, shielded, you know, them from talking to marketing. So, yeah, yeah I hear you. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, I think some of the other tactics that you were saying, hey, I want to have sales. I want to have marketing on the sales huddle. 
Mm-hmm. What I like to do is I like to see, can I get sales to sit down with marketing and see what their editorial calendar is, see what their roadmap is, like and that. literally yeah. say, like, this is what we think they're saying, but what are you hearing from the ground? Yes. All right? Because, you know, we can we can do it based upon what we think best practices are or what the industry right. is saying. But you know what? Everything, every client is nuanced. What are you hearing? Because I want yeah. you to tell us as opposed to us guessing what what you're seeing on a daily basis. You know, you brought a very good point. And I like that a lot in terms of when I created editorial and many companies, um, when they actually do marketing, creating marketing content, nowadays is very search or keyword driven, right? They understand mm-hmm. who their audiences are and they will do a lot of keyword search and understand what uh, keywords they are using. And they use SEO and uh, or optimize it and to create your content. And you brought another aspect of that, which is, you know, in addition to have SEO, in addition to have keywords, in addition to understand your audiences, that how they search, well, talk to your customers as well, talk to your salespeople as well. And they will have insight and bring that insight uh, into the content that you're going to create. I like that a lot. Cool. See, Todd, I won. Well, this... All right, <laughs> Quit one con I mean, zero. It's, it's, All right, no, it's I not go. really fair, just because he always he always seems to win. Um, Tom right. was like, "All right, please, Pam, seriously. I got a tough one for you." Mm-hmm. So, right. from a sales please. perspective, it's really clear okay. and obvious what motivates salespeople. You know, we're motivated by quotas. We're mm-hmm. motivated by more money. We're motivated by motivated by like ringing the bell. Right. So it's super, like yeah. super yeah. qualitative in the sense that, man, I know. Yeah. I met a quota. I didn't exactly. Quota. Yeah. Yes. So like, it's pretty clear. And like, for me to get motivated, it's just like, man, I want to make more money. I want to make more sales. I want to bring in more customers, yeah. you know, like super, super easy. Right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. from the sales side, super easy to figure that out. What motivates a marketing person? <laughs> Don't give me that answer. Come on. Give me something good. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, next question, please. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Chris, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> Enough softballs. We're getting to some meat no, here. I am. I am just going. I have something to share about that. And uh, Chris, you tell me if I'm actually on and off on this. All right. I think marketers have the tendency uh, to please people. Okay, we do. And uh, we want to do a good job and want, we want to be recognized. And um, we want our marketing campaigns to perform well. It's that sense of doing a good job. And also, there's another thing, to be respected. Okay. I think I talk to many, many marketers. They are very frustrated. They feel like the, they are in a sweatshop mm-hmm. and they don't feel they've been respected you know, within inside the company. And sometimes that has a lot to do with maybe they are too Uh tactical, you know, the work they do or how they communicate with their management has not been elevated to show that they are strategic. So when I talk to them, they, a lot of time they say, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I'm frustrated because whatever I said, and then nobody um, uh, give me that voice or respect me. I think the sense of being respected And also the sense of like, you know what? I'm actually make a difference. I'm doing a great job. These two things somehow motivate the marketers. But Chris, tell me if I'm on or off on this one. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's definitely the case. I think we're in a very unique spot. We implement HubSpot for a lot of our clients. And so one of the things that's interesting from us from a marketing perspective is I can go back to my team and I can say, yeah, Todd closed this sale. But let's look at their buyer's journey and rewind. And I can say, this guy came in from this keyword that we wrote a blog about. And then he downloaded this ebook. And then we drip market to him here, here, and here. Todd picked up the phone here. At one point, he got basically, he started to have drop off. And then we created that video that talked about the five things that every company should know about X. And then all of a sudden, between his sales prowess and our marketing materials, we came up with a sale. Okay. And so what's been fun about tech, using technology, technology is it's almost like every time we get a win, and our company is small enough where Todd can lean back and be like, hey man, I don't think I could have ever done it without this or anything like yeah. that. 
Mm-hmm. And then when he says that to me, I take full credit. So <laughs> the main thing I do as a CEO is any win I like to push towards me and any accomplishment that he does, I like to push way, way down so nobody can see it. <laughs> <laughs> great leader, Chris. Great, great, great leadership. Great leadership. Yeah. Great he, leadership. he always has his hand in his shirt yeah. like this too. <laughs> That's great. But you know, but you are, but Chris, you are in a very nice position because you have a data to demonstrate yes. in terms of the ROI of a uh, uh, marketing's contribution. But mm. I can assure you, many companies mm. are not there yeah. at all. And because they have a hard time, marketers have a hard time articulating a contribution. Therefore, it's very hard to win that respect. Totally. Does that make yeah. sense? Mm-hmm. So one thing I actually start and working very closely with the clients, even startup, is I ne- you basically need to focus on your MarTech, right? Yep. Now everything is uh, in mm-hmm. digital. And for digital to work flawlessly and effectively, that means the back end needs to be integrated. You have to understand your workflows. You have to understand how your data, especially lead data, from flows one from one point to another, right? That doesn't happen automatically. You need somebody to actually build that integration. And I think a lot of marketers, they don't focus on that. And it took me a while to understand yep. that as well. And I spent so much time doing that, even for my own yeah, business. That's cool. Does that yeah. make sense? But when I was working the traditional, when I was in the corporate, I was in the corporate for 20 years. I call myself a corporate rat. And, mm. um, and, but when I was there, I didn't do a very good job of building that workflow, understand the processes, and try to have everything tied together. And so things tend to be disjointed. When you are so disjointed, you cannot see how data sure. flows. But Chris, you are in a very good spot. Because you can see how leads flows from one place to another, from marketing yep. to sales. And th- that's a really right? good point because yeah. in our gap assessment, Chris, that fifth tab is actually called sales mm-hmm. and marketing. You know, our, our job is to basically, yeah. you know, uncover all the gaps to your marketing, website, content, SEO, all that. But the last piece is how does everything come together and how can we fix that for you? Yeah, come absolutely. together. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. I, I got yep. another one for you. Another quote from your book. You, you're going to okay. love me. All right. me. So you wrote this in your book. Um, I, I took a little offense right. to this one, but we're going to work this out. Um, <laughs> I tend okay. to offend okay. people. I'm, I'm okay, Sorry, I'm okay I with that. I, I happen to read well. So, but um, <laughs> salespeople hate, listen, listen, salespeople hate change. Okay. They are set in their ways and want to repeat whatever worked in the past. Now, as much as I resented that statement, I agree with that statement. You are not wrong. But what have you found as an effective way to help salespeople change? Okay. I want to tell you yeah. it's hard. And uh, especially, and also there's a generation Absolutely. issue mm-hmm. as well. If you talk to an uh, incredibly seasoned uh, sales professional and um, they have their ways <laughs> down and it has worked for a long period of time, and uh, they perfect it, and that's how they want to work, okay, yeah. honestly. Even you talk to the younger generation that incredibly mobile mm-hmm. savvy, they also have a specific process. They got it down. Just like you, Todd, you, you ha- you, you, I'm pretty sure in your mind, there's a process, there's a flow that you use, and you feel like, hey, over 20 years of a sales, you kind of perfect it, right? And that that works very well because it works so well, you don't want to rock the boat. And I completely understand that. I do. And um, I I try many, many different ways to work with sales and especially uh, the the to ramp new tools. Remember, I talked about the back end needs to be integrated. Sometimes you have to ramp the tools that salespeople need to use. And I always encounter the issue that the low adoption rate. If you want to train salespeople to use new tools, yep. man, it's like pulling it teeth. Yeah. It is. You know how many times that I fail miserably? Like literally, you know, ramp everybody, train everybody, but the, the adoption rate was just low. I cannot get them to use it, even though I show the benefit. That's because they kind of like move back to how mm-hmm. they want things to work. And there are a couple of things I have tried, and I'm not saying I have a mixed results on that, okay. honestly. Number one is tied with some of the initiative with the Okay, quota. that makes sense. Yeah. They can only get mm-hmm. bonuses 
if, if they're certain, if they're if following the adoption certain rate adoption rules. Up. Yep. If they're following mm-hmm. certain thing. But with that being said, it's always like they are incredibly grumpy of about that. Yeah. <laughs> and that then you have to get VP of sales uh-huh. buy in. A lot of them, that's the hardest yep. part too, right? Because they don't want they they are very protective of their children. All the VP of sales protect their salespeople, right? You need to really show the benefit of it. I'm talking now at the enterprise level that that the salespeople will benefit and they will relent, rel, uh, gradually to uh, you know have that adoption rate or whatever you want to do to tie with okay. their bonuses. So I think tie with the bonuses actually motivate yep. them to change their behavior. The other thing is you have to talk from the perspective your customers yes, are changing, definitely. right? Yeah. So. That's another way. Basically, for example, um, initially when I think about 10 years ago and I tried to train the salespeople, try to do their uh, research, try to do their you know, prospect and lease uh, research on LinkedIn. That's only about 10, 15 years ago, right? And they were like, why? Why do I need to be yeah. on LinkedIn? Blah, blah, blah. It's so much work. I kind of know how to reach, it, reach to them. I know how to talk to them. And then that, that we, that now we have a term called social selling. But way back then, again, we did multiple uh, rounds of training. They just not into it. But ne- but over a period of time, they kind of got it. Like, you know mm-hmm. what? Our customers are changing. They are not, they are in the digital world. We need to do that. So another thing is we kind of come from the perspective that your customers are evolving, are shifting. You need to. And that is another big motivator. And I think that prove so much so during pandemic. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. And that uh, when they cannot travel yeah. anymore, right? And that mm-hmm. uh, and that uh, they have to do they have to do camera. And uh, Todd, I don't know about you. Many of the salespeople I talk to, they are incredibly charming stop, stop, when you stop. put them in front of your prospect. They are charming. Right, they on, put them on. in front of your prospect, you to talk, <laughs> blah blah blah. Yeah. And Todd, you look great. And uh, they were like, and the uh, Chris obviously yeah. rolled his eyes to the left. So yeah. uh, you put them in front of the prospect, they yeah. know how to talk. But when you put them in front of the camera, they were like, yeah, exactly. It's crazy. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know, they kind of, they kind of just freeze. I know. I know. Yeah. So, and then you, I, I, we have to start training the salespeople to be comfortable with yeah. the camera. Right. And then, then just, you know, that little green dot that yeah. comes up, we basically yeah. say, see that and visualize that as your I, prospect. That's crazy. Because when they see that, they kind of like, um, you know, um, for today, what I really want to talk exactly. about yeah. is our company. Slide you one. Know, but I said, you know, where's yeah. that charm? Exactly. I want to see that um, charm. And, and I, I got to be really so, honest with you. I sold like person to person, face to face for 20 years. Right. And then, right. And it yeah. was awesome. And that like to get in a room with somebody and to get that contact and, you know, like, you know what NLP is, you know, n- neuro linguistic programming, like basically like uh, 93% of what you say is nonverbal. Right. So only 7% is okay. the words. Right. Yeah. So like you walk into a room and you're using right. all of this yeah. NLP and you've, you've got like this swagger and a smile. Yeah, right. And yeah. it's mm-hmm. so hard to get on a two dimensional screen. Right. So totally when the agree. pandemic came and you're like, I could not imagine having to sell a new customer through a it's video camera. Hard. Everybody's and, struggling but, with that. But Everybody's the crazy part struggling. is it? Well, like you didn't have a choice. So it was basically yeah. adapt or die. So Chris yeah. has this awesome, we'll, we'll send you this link later, but there's this really, there's this professor from, uh, I think it's NYU, and he just talks about how like the pandemic's just accelerated everything, right? And it's accelerated sales yeah. to the fact that like you basically had to figure out how to use Zoom and sell a customer, do an FTA, I totally follow agree. up, send yeah. a video mm-hmm. follow up, you know, yeah. so there's a lot of adaption to that. Follow up, follow yeah, up, follow up. it's crazy, up. but yeah. A, B, C, always be closing. Baby. Always be no. closing. Yeah. yeah. So- Pam, I do want to, I'm going to, I want to talk w- about one thing about how companies sort of adapt and how they sort of do that, you know, that shift. And okay. I'm a big, I'm a big history buff, big JFK fan, like, you know, John F. Kennedy. And he, uh-huh, he wrote, uh-huh. the, he was, he was always a fan of this book called the guns of August. And the guns of August was a book about world war two. Uh-huh. It turns out when America got in the war, they just thought we made this immediate impact. And it turned out that we got our butts kicked for the first year of World War II when we were involved, yeah. like yeah. just could not compete. And it was because all of the generals were following the playbook that won World War I, right? Yeah. 
So mm-hmm. now World War II, the technology has changed. The tactics have changed. Change, the generals yeah. do different things. Yeah. All of that stuff, has they've adapted technology. And what we find in our space is we bring that MarTech. We bring HubSpot. We bring content marketing and inbound marketing and all that approach. And what we're trying to do is pull people by their hair to say, stop using yesterday's playbook because the times are different. Your clients have different expectations. You know what I mean? And so that's one of the things that – that we just see, you know, all the time on the sales front is like, you know what? We actually have found a faster and better close rate of people that are already using HubSpot and already using technology than people that have never adopted only because maybe their implementation partner didn't do a good job. But we're always hungry for the people that understand that change, you know, is progress. You know what I mean? I'm not saying you want to just damn the torpedoes and throw everything out, but I do find that the companies that are willing to be nimble and adjust, yep. they almost always win. I 100% agree with that. I think Salesforce or the sales team, regardless age and demographics, have come to realize that they are in a completely different stage of the selling. And also, and they need to act differently. The pandemic, I think, is kind of like a wake-up call for many of us in a lot of ways. And I think... That including the the selling uh, tactics, that including a lot of some of us actually kind of go through that soul searching journey. They call it like this year or last year is like kind of like era of a great resignation. How many people left their job that that first raised the heck out of them and trying to do something totally different. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely have impact, not just on the sales force, but also on all of us that actually kind of work our own journey and to determine what we want to do next. Yeah. Um, now, I want to kind of pivot to one of the things that you had said in your book, but I also saw you say it in an interview. Okay. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting on your approach as like saying, you know what, the... The classic salesperson now actually almost has to become a marketer in his own right. You know what I mean? His or her own right. Um, Unpack that a little bit. And then I'm going to talk to you about why, even in the hiring process, that has mattered to me. So can you unpack that? How does a salesperson make that paradigm shift to become a marketer? So I want to make, I, I, before I even address that, I want to talk about uh, a term that might be a little bit overused, but it's very important, personal brand. Right. With the digital uh, camera, I'm sorry, digital world and especially the Facebook, LinkedIn and uh, uh, Twitter. And even now everybody is on on, on, on TikTok and uh, all of a sudden your voice, who you are, becomes important. Right. Salespeople in the past, they only have to be like in front of the prospects. Now, all of a sudden you can have your own voice. You not just be a salesperson, you probably can also share your expertise in terms of how to sell. Granted, some of them you probably have to adjust and then share your knowledge, right? So that personal brand, that personal, um, just like you, all three of us are in front of camera, right? And uh, imagine like just five years ago, like in front of camera all the time, that's almost unthinkable. So now that personal brain becomes important, your voice becomes important, you, you will knowledge you can actually share and also probably mean something. Then if you want to actually present yourself all of a sudden, all of a sudden, that you have to think like a marketer. Like how can you be so comfortable in front of camera? How can you kind of like talk about certain things in a way that in a very succinct manner? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. How are you going to present yourself that inconsistently that is on your personal brand? So that's what I was thinking in terms of salespeople. Like, Todd, you look great. I love you. You know? I love you. Love you. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think you guys shared a moment here. <laughs> 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 so you look good, good in front good. of the camera. So now you have to think like, <laughs> like a marketer. It's like, how are you going to you yeah. know, share your knowledge and also make yourself like comfortable and then uh, get more deals? Sometimes it's not even more deals. It's broadening your network. So mm-hmm. I personally think not just the salespeople, like everybody needs to think like a marketer. Yeah. And that's changing even how I consider hiring 
for sales or just even, you know, there used to be the phrase, you're only as good as your database. When I think of a salesperson, I think you're only as good as your Rolodex. That's primary. Yeah. Yeah. Step number two is how do you create one to many experiences? Yeah. So like a sales experience is one to one or maybe one to two or whatever that is. As a sales guy, I'm like, hey, how do you create these one-to-many experiences? To in scale. my opinion, the number one way is what you just said. You get yeah. on camera yeah. and you start talking about products and services in a humble yet humanizing way. Yeah. I'm telling you it's going to translate. It's going to work. Yeah. And a lot of time, I salespeople, they are shied away from that. And I, most of the time, I told them, just be yourself. You, you yeah. can you can do this on a one to one basis. Well, you know, even when you do it one to many, just just imagine you are talking to one person. Yeah. And then and just be yourself. You know, yep. you are so good at selling this stuff. You know what? Yep. You can do it on camera. It's all good. Now, one other question that I have is: we develop something that we call quasi, which means mm-hmm. questions with answers and simple information. Okay. And so if a client asks me a question, I'm going to give them a quick answer, but then I'm going to say, hey, you know what? If you want that in more depth, you know, here's a blog I can send you or here's a video I can send you or things like that, right? Yeah. What I, the question I sort of have for you is how do salespeople help with that initiative in the aspect of they have boots on the ground and how can they basically not only answer the question, but also provide more information. So um, I always tell my salespeople and um, salespeople kind of know the know this by um, themselves as well. Like the term is keep the lead warm, right? You want to keep the lead warm and, uh, and uh, make sure that you keep facilitating, have that conversation, especially the high quality lead, right? You know that, you know, this company is good, they have a budget. You want to keep that lead warm. And the one way to keep that lead warm is you want to make sure that you create some opportunity to have a next conversation. You mm-hmm. need to create additional opportunity to, to, to actually get to know more people within that company. And yeah. the one way, and I share with uh, the salespeople, just like you said, it's like, you want to know more about this? You know what? I have some content I can share with you. Mm-hmm. You want to know more about that? You know what? I actually can do a quick demo for you. Or you mean you want to talk to your management about how to save additional money? You know what? Let me share a couple case studies I have. So content becomes a means that mm-hmm. salespeople can use to drive, to be a conversation opener and to drive the next conversation. Absolutely. That makes sense. So yeah. it's how to keep that lead warm. And the content is one way to do that. So, yeah. and yeah. Uh, to, to me, that usually when I, when I share the content with, um, with my salespeople, my sales peeps, I call them, it's like, I will always tell them how to use that content. I try to put in the perspective. I say, you know what? Yeah. This is probably the content that is better used when you are having, you know, uh, this kind of conversation. Or and uh, this content is actually uh, used when you kind of start prospecting them or whatever. Trying to put things in perspective. So. It's it's funny because um, I don't know who coined it. Might have been you. I, I I've listened to so much of your stuff and read your book. I'm like every time I every time I prepare for these interviews, it's almost like where did I hear them? Like, oh, probably it, yeah. you. <laughs> Pam said it. But like it's almost like imagining sales is like a Netflix episode. Like yeah. the reason why Netflix almost always works is because they create watching. a show that no. you can binge watch. You binge watch. There's always that moment in the show where you're like, well, this show's kind of dragging on. I don't know. But then the last two minutes of that show are like, oh my gosh, I got to watch that next episode. And then you're yeah. up at three in the morning because you're always leaving them waiting for something just a little bit more and a little bit yeah. more and a little bit more. Yeah. You know that's what I mean? True. Yeah. And so it's like, that's kind of weird. That's how sales kind of keeps you going is like, you know what? We had a great, we covered some really great things, but next, <laughs> tune in next week. Because <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk about another thing that you might find interesting. That's right. Uh, do you yeah. like money? Do you like money? Because <laughs> next week I'm going to show you how to save a lot of <laughs> I hear yeah. you. I hear you. I mean, that's a, that's also another thing. Like I was talking, I, I have a podcast uh, of my own, B2, uh, B2B Marketing and More. 
And um, there was one guest that uh, came to my show, and uh, we are, and and he's a content marketer. And I say, how do you measure, you know, success and effectiveness of content? Content is kind of abstract; it's very hard to measure. And the one of the the, the metrics that uh, he was talking about is um, he actually take on the goal of returning traffic. You know, like people like come back over and over again and to their website to look for new content. And uh, because of, you know, everybody has IP sniffers nowadays, you kind of can see the IP yep. address that they come in. And uh, so one thing that they do is like, you know, rather than looking to like uh, uh, new traffic and also new downloads, you also took on um, an, an, uh, uh, a metrics like returning traffic. Yeah. That means the content is working that people come back and try to check on their stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Tom, I got one got more next? question for you, Pam. Um, all, all right. right. So he, here's, here's, and this is a tough one. So I'm sorry I saved this for last, but I think you can handle it. What, in re, <laughs> in, in reading through your book, um, there was a lot of reference to large companies, right? And then yeah. the reference to large companies, and then there was a lot of reference to sales enablement, you know, and their departments and yes. people specifically responsible for sales enablement, right? So from our perspective, you know, our like perfect customers probably maybe like 10 to 25 million, right? So they, they, Got it. So it's a mid-sized company. company. It's that, that's it's probably our sweet company, spots, yeah. midsize. So my question for you is, yeah. um, if, if you're not a large company, if you don't have a sales enablement mm -hmm. department or person that handles it, right? Yeah. What do you? How can you suggest, or what do you have for the small to mid-sized company to sort of get on board with sales enablement to basically get that moving a little better? Um, if you don't have a department yeah. or a specific person that can handle it, so. Great question. So I want to address that from two different perspectives. One is top down. The one, the other okay. one's bottom up. Because if you are in a mid-sized company or a small company, your uh, marketing team is probably mm -hmm. very small and pretty nimble, right? You probably only have a senior director or VP of um, uh, marketing. And then the sales team, depending on the, the product that you sell, and again, because it's a mid-sized company, the sales force is probably not huge either. And in that, ca in that case, uh, during the annual planning cycle, you know, majority of the, the salespeople will plan their one year ahead in terms of what the sales goal they want to meet for next year. And I always encourage uh, the, the VP of sales, invite uh, the VP or the, the senior director of marketing to join that meeting, right? So it's a top-down approach. And uh, if the salespeople open that door, and trust me, marketing will gladly be part of it. Right. So open that door, invite them and as a part of your sales planning, because if marketing people understand the sales planning, what you go on to ac accomplish, they can you they can understand in terms of what marketing channels or marketing plan they need to do to actually help the sales team. So that's top down. Right. Have a joint planning, uh, especially strategic. joint annual right. planning session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Strategic discussion. So that's top down. Once the top is aligned, you know, all the worker bees will align because okay. they see it. Yeah, sure. Does that make sense? It's kind of like role modeling. Then the other thing is bottom up. And uh, as a, a marketer, if you are a worker bee in a small company, you probably wear multiple hats. That's just the way it is. And uh, like I said earlier, I mentioned about attending sales huddles meeting. You know, if you if you can attend the meeting on a regular basis, you can help out quite a bit. The other one is um, whenever you are doing campaigns, whenever you have to create new content, communicate that proactively mm -hmm. with the salespeople, right? Mm -hmm. Tell them that, hey, we created new content. Hey, we are doing this campaign. Hey, this is our success. Share that information with salespeople. The, the sales are not gonna proactively uh, look for that kind of information, but proactively be in front of their faces and say, guess yep. what? This is what I'm doing yep. for you, right? And to try to entice that conversation. So that's yeah. the bottom up. That makes sense. All right, I got a question for you about, um, you, we refer to it as SQL, like sales qualified leads. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges that we hear a lot or mm -hmm. uh, is a market, the marketing team works to drum up leads. Yeah. Right? The sales the, the sales professional can say, hey, you know what? That lead wasn't qualified. I know. Right? Yeah. But the 
the opposite can also happen in the aspect of the salesperson might have either a bias or something about that lead that you we can tell through HubSpot or something like that, that it's very possible that they simply didn't follow up either timely, consistently, or whatever that is. Yeah. And so what you have is you have this arm wrestling match where they're basically pointing to one another. And we see this with clients all the time. It's like, we've drummed up a hundred, a hundred leads this, you know, this quarter. And they'll, they'll say, well, the, a lot of those leads weren't qualified. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, let me just walk through the names of the companies themselves. And you know what I mean? Like you're talking about yeah. massive organizations. How are they not a fit? You know what I mean? And, and it just starts to be one of those things where it's just like, well, marketing's not sitting on the phone call with you and sales isn't, you know what I mean? So like, so how do you unpack that in the qualification standpoint? Process. Between, yeah. Okay. There are two ways I want to address that. Number one is a definition. The other one is qualification process. And uh, let's talk about qualification process. And uh, the qualification process, it tends to be very muggy. And the marketing team will say, oh, that's a sales job. It's an inside sales job to actually qualify that. And then the inside sales was like, okay, the quality is so bad. And it takes, it's very time consuming to even qualify it. I'm not going to do that work. Mm-hmm. So the qualification process um, is always uh, trick everybody in terms of who should own that, honestly. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, there's no right or wrong answer at all. Uh, mm-hmm. Every company does it differently. And every company has their own process that they do. Sometimes it's inside sales people that are doing that. Sometimes it's demand gen uh, a team that's doing that. Sometimes even they hire a third party company to actually do that. So there is no right or wrong way of doing it. Everybody does differently. But before you unpack the qualification process, I want to talk about the definition of MQL and the SQL. And uh, the nine out of 10 uh, clients I talk to, none of them, most of them actually don't have a very clear definition what NQL is. And uh, some of them, it will say, oh, it's a content score, right? They come to my website five times and they have seen, they downloaded five different pieces of content. They reach a content, uh, the, the, the sc- a least scoring of 75, therefore, therefore it's qualified. But trust me, when I do a lot of research, you know, to write a blog, I will go to HubSpot site like 5,000 times to, to download and to read some stuff. But honestly, in, even I have a least scoring of 120 based on their You're system, I am not their target audience because I was just going there to actually do research and write my blog. Yeah, Does that makes sense. So yeah, sure. I will have a least score that's very high, but I'm not their target account. So I always tell my clients that you have to make your MQL definition so clear, so crystally clear, there is no confusion. So Lead Genius is a company, it's a SaaS-based platform company that actually help people capture lead. And uh, they made that they made the lead MQL so clear that there's no confusion between sales and marketing. That definition is whoever requests click the button on their website and request a demo. Mm-hmm. So it's not lead scoring. It's not people come to a website. It's not people download. It's people mm-hmm. click on the request, the request for demo and yeah. then actually fill out the form. That's what they consider MQL. It's that clear. Mm-hmm. Because of that definition is so clear and so hard to achieve. So they focus on the quality of MQL. So number of the MQL actually decrease the goal for marketer and that also impact in terms of how they create their website. So they have request demo button on multiple different places strategically. Why? Mm-hmm. Because the clear definition of MQL. Mm-hmm. And they also make the SQL incredibly clear. The MQL, the SQL is basically MQL qualified by inside sales and meet ICP, ideal customer gotcha. profile. Otherwise, it will not be considered. So, SQL. so you're saying you're the, the definition is so yeah. rigorous. There's no confusion. So, so you're saying the SQL is a derivative of the MQL. Okay, that makes yes. sense. Okay, I do. Yeah. So, um, so that means that the the marketing team is responsible to actually create MQL and they narrow down the funnel, right? For example, this people coming to a track, uh, coming to your website. That's a lot of people. Then somebody has to qualify them to MQL. And that's by, um, you know, people click on request for demo and fill out the form. And then the next one is 
now they not just like fill out the form request for demo. They have to mm -hmm. meet like ICP gotcha. definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's like, it's so clear. There's no confusion. So, but most of the marketers are not willing to take on that kind of definition because it's very hard. Yeah. And also not only hard. And second thing is you have to re reduce the, the legal, uh, the, the, the MQL. If you make that so clear, that means you really focus on high quality lead. The number of the lead coming from marketing is not going to be 500 a week, maybe 50. So you have it's, to reduce that tremendously. And that's, that's the thing because there's, as a marketer, I'm also trying to say, look, you know what? If we set the bar so high, you yeah. know what? Like I'm expecting you in sales to also know how to hunt too, because yeah. if I reduce the lead pool by what you said by 75% by 10x for example 10X, right you know what i mean yeah then you're also going to have to hunt you know what i mean yeah because you have to hunt that means the lead i give to you is pretty high quality then you have yeah. to kind of take on that and run with it you know so yeah yeah it's very yeah. hard that 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 transition is incredibly hard and uh and uh honestly nothing against marketers even for me to take on that kind of goal that means you need the marketers, all the marketing campaigns that you are running, you would need to be pretty buttoned up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I almost always find that the challenge is that you go and you create all this energy for, for leads and you hear these stories, right? Where I created this sale and the sale wasn't my exact buyer persona or it wasn't qualified in this certain way. And I made them qualified right? And then all of a sudden you think, well, I can do that with every lead. And then sales guys are like, no, I got no. lucky on that one. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? And I, I, it's so funny because everyone remembers the luck. Like you, you close a hundred sales in a year, but everyone always points to, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. The one guy that hit the first pitch and it was a home run and you're like, well, why can't we just get more of those? I'm like, well, if we get more of those, I wouldn't need a marketing team. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's hard. I mean, Honestly, you know, like everything else in life, there's always a certain percentage of luck involved. And um, yep. I think a lot of marketing that you do, even with the technology's help, is you kind of like bend the odd to your favor. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of time I see like, you know, what can I do to bend that odd uh, for my Make favor? Make myself more lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my lottery <laughs> ticket. Yeah. Well, then also you do the same thing on your marketing reports. Yeah. Too, because you know what I mean. You're, I don't know how to describe it. Like I've got, <laughs> I got to give a report, and I have a hundred metrics. Most of them are bad, but I got sixteen good ones. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> That's it. okay. <laughs> it's a yeah. It's another way to dashboard. It's actually pretty hard because when you do a different channels, you have a different kind of dashboard. You do email yep. marketing, you have opening rate, and you do website, and you have website traffic, and you do outbound marketing. You probably have you know shares like and tweets and so but mm -hmm. at the end of the day to me is that mql in the b2b side i cannot speak for the b2c it's still about yep. leads i hate saying yep. this yeah yep now one of the other thing that i find interesting right is that uh -huh. you go and you you go and you hire a marketing company right okay somebody hires us and they're like they're so hungry about lead generation Right. And I'll just, I'll just tell this kind of like facetious story. They're like, we need to be on the first page of Google. And I'm like, why? You don't. Yeah. No. Or we need to be really great at social. I'm like, why? No. And you I, don't. I'm, I'm yeah. only saying, like, you know what? If I went to your website, is your message clear? Yeah. What, give me the top 20 questions you hear on a regular basis. Can I even find them on your website? Yeah. And so, like, before I can even, like the worst thing I could do is bring your targets to your website right now because you're you are not, not delivering to, you're, the you're, promise. You're, you're, you are not yeah. delivering the promise that uh, you intend to do. Yeah. Or you're making them think that so many mental calories that even if you could, even if you could literally, you were, you were Shakespeare, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. If, if, if none of that content's on your page is not digestible, you can't find it or anything like that. Like I'm going to spend a ton of time, yeah. energy and money bringing the horse to water but you're making it very hard for them to drink yeah you know what i mean and that's that's yeah. what we run as as marketing companies because they're so like hungry on like 
we should just get a cold caller. <laughs> I'm like, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So, you know, <laughs> I completely understand everything you said. I'm running to a similar issue talking to some of the clients as well. And I think um, a lot of time, given that I was in the corporate world for 20 some years, I can totally understand and uh, also very uh, empathetic in terms of some of the requests they made to you. That's because some of those requests is probably top-down driven coming from the management team. You know, um, we need to rank number one uh, so people can find us. Um, we need to, you know, we need to be on social so people can find us. You know, it. But I always uh, tell them, I say, what is the objectives that you want to accomplish? If your objective is coming, you get more leads. Let's look at the customer journey. Let's also look at the sales stages. And let's see how we can optimize and refine that. So to mm-hmm. accomplish your goal. I say being ranking number one, maybe good, maybe one way to accomplish that goal. But that may not be the only way. So um, I hear you, but I also understand where they're coming from. And sometimes is they being um, pushed, if you will, internally. So, yeah, I hear you. I yeah. hear you. Yeah. And Todd, do me a favor. Unpack how we develop that sales cycle analysis, like what we do when we bring them into our yep. place. And all yeah. So like basically, uh, Pam, when you come to Philly, we'll show you a room. We have a room. It's like a whiteboard room. And we basically draw a diagram. Okay. And it's, it's kind of like yeah. it's the client's journey, but it's also the sales journey. You know, so that entry point is what yeah. we call an FTA, first time appointment. You know, and then uh-huh. we have STA yeah. and then it might be a TTA, third time appointment. And then it goes proposal yeah. and it's either closed or won, right? So what we do is yeah. with our clients mm-hmm. is, As a sales yeah, stages. so we're, yeah. We're, we're defining the stages of the sale, right? And then, so that's really cool because I love that conversation, you know, because a lot of people, a lot of companies have never sort of mapped it out. They've thought about it. They do it every day, but they haven't really thought about it as a journey. They didn't formalize Exactly, the right. Process, so what yeah. we do is from a marketing perspective is what we're looking to find is, all right, in this process, where's the drop off, right? So what we can do is we talk to that Got and it. then, so yeah, do we'll analysis. do some analysis. Yeah. So we might find that, you know, after the STA, the second time appointment, there's a 55% drop off. All right, so yeah, which is you, what you can do. Right. So then this is where, and I love this part, because now that we've sort of mapped out the sales journey, marketing comes in and says, all right, here's what we need to do to reduce that drop off. Maybe we need some collateral. Maybe we need, we need a video to explain this. Maybe we need um, like a, a page on our website that defines uh, an issue or something like that. So what we do is once we map this out, we figure out where uh, marketing can interject some assets to speed up the yep. process, reduce drop off, you know, and get more closed ones. Yeah. It's uh it's also um I do something similar but not using that term is content okay. mapping. Yeah. Which is you mm-hmm. map uh the relevant content to certain sales stages and also gives uh sales ideas in terms of what content they can use it at certain stages um to actually help them to increase their conversion rate. Yes. I 100% cool. agree. Yeah. Good. I, I got one last question. We're starting to get to our time. Um, you talk a bit about AI. Um, uh-huh. And well, I'm going to let you unpack a little bit about how you, how you think about, how, you know, I'm going to let you unpack about how, how AI is affecting business, marketing, and sales. But I think one of the questions I sort of have, because I, I'm aware that, you know what, AI is going to replace a lot of jobs in yeah. this world. Yeah. But I also think it's going to actually help companies get to different places that yeah. they couldn't get to before. So, for example, like when everyone was working on an abacus, when they created a calculator, they didn't say, oh, guess what? You know what? There'll be no more accountants anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I, I always feel like AI is just going to be that tool that's going to take care of some of the basics so that humans can now go and do the things that we didn't have time to do because we spent so much time, you know what I mean? Like doing do. general calculation or whatever that is. Yeah. So I, I, while I'm afraid that it's going to take away jobs, I also am aware that, you know what, it actually might create jobs too. Oh, definitely. 100% agree. That, that yeah. analogy is actually really similar to coding. You know, when coding first, first started, it basically – you know, created a system that was just like, wow, we can automate all these things now using code, right? But what did it do? 
It just took us to where we are today. You know, so like to your now we right now we got to write more code, right? We have to do <laughs> we, we we have to develop more languages. We have to develop like more platforms to support those languages. Yeah. So Chris, I feel like I feel yeah. like that's a great question because the AI is not going to even though it might replace jobs. I think it's going to create more jobs because it's just going to expand the, the universe of what AI can actually get us to. Yeah. 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 I, so you guys hit the core. Um, you know, I think whenever there is a new technology coming, there's always job being eliminated and always job mm-hmm. being created, right? Like um, way, way long time ago in the late 1900, I mean, sorry, early 1900, uh, when the phone, when we start using telephone, there's the cable mm-hmm. girls. Right. And they change the switches on a regular basis. And then we replace that with automatically switch. They, you know, probably become some, they probably need to find a totally different job. But that doesn't mean that job has eliminated and then human, um, humans have nothing else to do. And the AI will play a role to replace some jobs or, or, um, or make your job easier. And I'm going to give a couple examples. Um, the number one, I always tell marketers that uh, don't stay put. Like for a long time, I was a traditional marketer and, um, you know, I do a very traditional media buy, right? Then when digital comes, you do a lot of programmatic uh, ad media buy. So the, 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 the function of job has changed and the technology kind of somehow make that job a little bit easier, but you still do media buy. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? But now yeah. it's more technology centric. And that's not necessary. Then you have to learn in terms of the, the logic and also how to do a media buy, but you are using slightly different platform. So it does change your job. So the continuous learning and be a life learner is very critical for all of us, not just marketers, not salespeople. There's always a new platform that will come and that you need to learn how to use those tools, right? How many tools have we, has been like tsunami over uh, us in the past five, uh, 10 years? You know, yeah. just the, the number of a social media platform up to mm-hmm. now, TikTok, which is like none exist like literally two mm-hmm. years ago. Right. So you have to be a continuous learner. That's one thing. Second thing is AI does well replace some part of your job, but that doesn't mean that your job will be eliminated. For example, um, artificial intelligence, if you brief them well, they can actually write a piece of content for you. Right. If you go to shortlyai.com, shortly, S-H-O-R-T-L-Y, AI.com, you can actually brief, you know, that uh, uh, the languaging process, language processing tool, you brief AI and then they start writing a paragraph or the blog post for you. But once that draft is created, it still requires you as a human to edit it. Yeah, absolutely. Does that make sense? So there are certain um, level of support that AI can do for you. And uh, like, for example, how many times that uh, the algorithm in Spotify, in Amazon, actually based on your past uh, listening behavior or your past purchasing patterns, predict what you're going to buy. That's algorithm in work. That's artificial intelligence in work. So imagine that scale exactly the same thing on the B2B side. Is it possible that there's an artificial intelligence platform that you can use and to analyze all your customer data and predict the propensity to buy? So yeah. from my perspective, AI have three major uh, functionality uh, for sales and marketing. Number one is predictive uh, capability uh, analytics, right? Can your data be analyzed and give you some sort of prediction? But that doesn't mean they are always right. They have mm-hmm. a bias just like us depending on the, the data we enter, you know, you know, if you have a quality data, then you might have a quality output. But if it's garbage in, guess what? It's garbage out. So they also have a bias. And the predictive analytics, number one. The second thing is segmentation and personalization. I mean, a lot of time you can use algorithm to read email and they can create a customized email, right? But again, you have to train them, right? So that's a personalization and segmentation. The other one, just like you indicated, repetitive tasks, like some of the stuff, you have to write weekly blog posts. Oh my God, that's so much work. Can we actually get, surely AI, you brief them well, can write the first draft and you take out and run with it. That's repetitive tasks. So AI can serve three functions. Like I said, predictive analytics, personalization and segmentation, and also uh, help you on repetitive tasks. It's not necessarily taking over your job. Is you have to think from the perspective how to make your job better. 
Nobody is creating marketing bot. Mm. Okay? Nobody is creating a sales bot. I'm talking about physical bot to take over your job yet. Yeah. None. Well, maybe it's coming, but it's not here. So. Yeah. All right. So we're getting close to that time. Um, and I, I'm sorry if I didn't brief you for this question oh, here. And so. It's all right. Uh, through the power of post-production, if you get it wrong, we can keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you've been in the game for about 20 years. You're writing really great content. You've written two books. How many books have you written? Uh, and I did uh, two books and I also have an ebook that's uh, published on Amazon. Yeah. You know, when it's all said and done, what do you, what do you think you want to be your legacy? <laughs> Oh my God. You got to be like, Hey, I'm too young to answer that question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, like a lot of time, especially, like I said, I work in a corporate for 20 years and then I have this uh, midlife crisis about seven years ago. So uh, to answer your question, let me just go back uh, history for seven years. And about seven years ago, I have this midlife crisis. I was like, Oh my God. I've been in the same company for 20 years and this company has treated me very, very well and I will respect it in the company and I have done so many different jobs within that company and I'm so grateful. But what do I want to do next? And just kind of, kind of like, you know, what do I want to do next and what is my legacy? What do I want to left behind? And um, um, I did not have an answer for that for a long time. I mean, I tried to scratch my head and I was like, you know, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what I'm really good at. And um, I, you know, obviously I have a wonderful family. I have two grown kids and they are very independent and uh, I have a wonderful mm -hmm. husband. Family-wise, personal life, there's no drama, which is perfect. Thank <laughs> God. Can you imagine have dramas? I probably will end up killing my kids. Can you imagine raising young children during pandemic? Oh my God, I have a huge respect. I have a five. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Oh my God! I have a huge respect for you, Chris. Yeah, huge respect. No, I trust respect. me. Have, if I have to, go ahead. Have respect for my wife. Like literally, I was breaking state laws to come into the office to get away because I was just like, I can't do this. I, I have a huge respect for parents <laughs> who are raising you know young children in the past one and a half years. I have huge respect yeah. for teachers. I have huge respect that they have to deal, they have to work and also take care of their children at the same time. If I, if I had to do that, I would kill my kids. I would literally <laughs> met CNN headline and I'm not kidding. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. I did not know what I want to do. I, I have a very, I'm very, very fortunate, knock on wood and have very solid, you know, life, quiet life actually for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And then, um, um, but one thing I know is I'm done with the corporate world. I wanted to leave. And then I started looking inward. And the one thing I do want to do is I want to write a book. So long story short, I always want, want to write a fictional mm. book, mm. like drama, the story, and that kind of stuff, right? And then I come to realize I have no caliber. <sighs> All right, you have to like, you just have to acknowledge that you have no talent whatsoever. And I was like, okay, fine, I can write a business book. And that, that's how I got started to kind of just unpack my knowledge. And I wrote my first book, How to Scale Content Across Region, Global Content Marketing. And then second book, How to Support Sales as a Marketer. And um, through the writing, uh, writing provides a sense of clarity. And I come to realize my, my, I'm very, very good at coaching and teaching people and very good at unpack complex ideas into some sort of framework that people can understand. And I, I just come to realize that my job is to coach, to teach. And if I can impact one marketer, at, you know, one at a time, that will be fine. So yeah. whatever I'm doing right now, it's more kind of from the perspective. And I share as much as I can. Like if I make, I work with my client and then certain things work very well, I immediately public a blog post and I share the templates, I share my framework. And if some other people can use it, fantastic. So. I guess in a way it's kind of like just helping marketer one marketer at a time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, that's, yeah. I see as my legacy maybe. I well, don't the know. Good thing, Pam, the good thing, Pam, is you're already there. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
Todd, Todd and I were talking quite a bit about being really looking forward to this interview. Oh, I think so we sweet. got introduced to you from Chad Pollitt. Um, yeah, and, I love Chad. Uh, oh my gosh, he's so great. He's so yes. great. Um, and um, anyhow, uh, it's been a pleasure. So thank you very much. Same um, here. If, if people did want to find out about you, uh, your books, or just everything that you're doing, how would they? How would they connect with you? Oh yeah, I have a website, pamdinner.com. So just go to uh, my website, www.pamdinner.com, D-I-D-N-E-R. Uh, that's my last name. And you can also find me on all social media channels. You know, I'm not on TikTok yet. I need to get my signature dance down. Uh, so I'm working yeah. on it. All right. And <laughs> yeah. also send me, you know, send me, a, it just like any social yeah. media channel will be great. Yeah. And the, yeah. my books are on Amazon. So that's great. That's great. Well, in relation to your TikTok moves, uh, Todd has a video series on five, five critical dance moves. Yeah, that, that, will that every sale, help you that every salesperson leads, needs. Leads. Yeah. That every salesperson Seriously, needs. Seriously, yeah. I in would definitely check that no. out. Yeah, yeah, but like you said, salespeople don't like to change. So Todd's was filmed in 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 1998. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the what worked it's, yesterday. It's done to the waltz. <laughs> Still <laughs> exactly. It's a two exactly. step, really. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, show it, Todd. Edge. Show it. Exactly. No, no, no. You, you have to cutting go, edge you, move called yeah. the robot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to look me up on TikTok. Pam, you are a joy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yep. Pam, you are a joy. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you so this much. It's been amazing, and we'll look forward to connecting awesome. with you again. Yay! Thanks, Thanks a lot. Pam. Thank you. Bye, Todd. Bye, Chris.